Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So I'll just formally start this. Uh, it is uh, uh, 5th of May 2020. It is week 12 of uh, Executive MBA Strategic Management class. It's 11 p.m. Uh, Karachi, Pakistan time. And uh, we have a guest speaker with us, Dr. Sergi from uh, District of Columbia University, U.S. And he is kind enough to join us uh, straight from, I think, his house, probably. And uh, his uh, cozy, uh, you know, study room. And uh, so we're going to record this, inshallah. And uh, then I'm going to share this with you as well, Dr. Sir. Outstanding. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Dr. Hart. So looking forward to interacting with, uh, with you all. And uh, excited to join and sort of uh, briefly have a discussion on strategic management and the like. Exactly. So uh, how do you want to proceed? Do you want to introduce yourself? And uh, I can just ask some students to then, you know, we have 28 students in this class, 28. So we can have some random uh, students who can just, uh, you know, tell about themselves, because all these are working professionals, because it is an executive MBA class. Uh, these are all working professionals working from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, mid to senior level positions in organizations. Uh, mostly corporate organizations, some of them are working in uh, public sector and uh, some are entrepreneurs, they have their own businesses. So it's it's a really uh, good mix, you know. Okay, uh, how old uh, what's a, um, uh, How old is a typical student and what's a level of experience? Like how many I years? Think, of... uh, I think uh, average age would not be more than I think 30, 32, yeah. Uh, we have young students as well who have just recently graduated and they started off uh, their master's program. But some of them are working professionals. They are in their mid-career, five years, six years into, you know, uh, corporate sector. And uh, some I have a very uh, seasoned professional in this class as well. He has served in, you know, he's working for IBM and Mr. Fezan. And uh, you would love to talk to him. He's a very seasoned professional, more than 20, 25 years of experience. So, okay. Yeah, we have seasoned professionals, we have young professionals, we have young entrepreneurs. There are people who have just started their startups and, you know, some are into food business, some are into logistics, so, you know, so it's a good mix. Fantastic. So you guys starting a new Google. Very good. <laughs> Outstanding. So, yeah, so why don't I briefly introduce myself and then the floor sure, maybe can sure. show and uh, sure, have it as a q and a. I don't really have a thousand slides, so... Uh, let me share the desktop and tell you who I am and uh, let me see. And, and let, I don't know if it's, oh. Okay, and I think you, sh I, I, you, you should be share. I, let's see, it's, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, we are able to see your screen, yes. Oh, okay, terrific. So briefly, I'm Dr. Sergey Ivanov, and uh, I teach at, uh, at the University of the, um, uh, Washington District of Columbia in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the United States, and uh, I'm right now also in Washington, D.C. So brief biography. So uh, so I've been in Washington, D.C. for a while, but I have con uh, done uh, work internationally. Uh, I haven't gotten to... Um, Middle Eastern countries, I haven't been to Pakistan, but I walked all over uh, the world. And uh, one of my books is uh, Why Organizations Fail, and sort of I work with usually medium-sized to preferably large organizations on their organizational improvement and leadership improvement. And so that's basically, I've spent uh, several decades in this field and absolutely like it. Now, regarding this talk today, uh, I sort of wanted to... I don't know if you had a chance. I sent uh, students two articles to read because exactly. obviously uh, I, I understand they don't have enough homework. So I will also be joining you, uh, sending you an additional exam. <laughs> By the way, is everybody fluent in English or do I need? Um... Everyone is fluent in English, yeah. That's okay. Fine. Yeah. All right. So in, uh, I don't know if they had a the chance, but I sort of sent them some articles to uh, have read regarding strategic. Uh, strategic, uh, I'm not, uh, strategic management, and then one article that I've written. I have several articles, but 
I sort of didn't really. Uh, so I sent you one article that sort of the beginning of the book called uh, "Why Organizations Fail." I wrote it uh, maybe a decade ago. There are some recent articles and so on. And so uh, my topic is fundamentally you know, organizations, how to improve them, uh, societal issues, and sort of interest me. And with that uh, brief presentation, maybe students. Uh, Maybe you, um, you can ask some questions. I'll show them on the board, and we can go from there. Sure, sure. Questions. And what I have it, I'm not sure if you can see my whiteboard. Uh, we can see it. We can see it, yes. Perfect. So what I'll do when you ask questions, I'll uh, write them down, and then maybe I can go through and answer some of those questions. Let me uh, turn on my... Um... OK. So let's go in. Let's start uh, with questions. Pezan Bhai, can you start with, yes. uh, with the first question? Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Yonov, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, this is Fezan. Uh, my first question is I was going through one of the articles that you uh, posted, <laughs> uh, one, uh, the one uh, from uh, Dr. Jacques, I think. Uh, so, what was the? Uh, I mean, I, I was just wanting to understand the connection between uh, what he seems to say is that you know the the tenure of decision making has an impact on the individuals individuals' career within the organization and therefore the success of the organization. Is that the correct understanding? Ah, that's a terrific question. Let me write it down if I understood it correctly. So your question yeah. is uh, whether. Uh, can you repeat the question again, and I'll try to write it down because I think it's sure. so. What I so, so, yes, as I read the article, what I understood uh, from that article was that what Dr. Jacques is trying to say is that the success of the organization depends upon uh, the the uh, time uh, uh, the time period of a decision maker of a particular role or a strata. So. Uh, I mean, what is the correlation between between this and the success for the organization is what I am trying to understand. It's a great question. So if I understood uh, the question correctly, uh, the relationship between organization success and the level of work, and I'll explain exactly what it is. Correct. And and what is he driving at? Actually, I mean, is this is this a hard and fast rule, or is this something which is, uh, you know, general observation? So, any any enlightenment on that on the on the whole on on his whole whatever his whole contention is, if you could just sort of explain where is he going with that? What is the thought behind that uh, that article? Profound question. Let me collect maybe four or five questions, and then I'll sort of answer all of them uh, in a Thank sequence. You. That's a terrific. Uh, Thank you, by the way, for reading this. Uh, the articles, and I'll answer a question also in the relationship to government organizations and IBM as well. So very good. Uh, any other questions? Uh, one or two? Uh, we'll get... Yeah. Yeah. Martin, do we have a question? Anyone? Uh, yeah. Name, name here. Ahmed, yes. Name Ahmed. Yes. Please. Yeah. Name. Ahmed. First of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Sergi, for joining us uh, in the class. And I have a question uh, regarding how the organization fit goes in the. Current trend, we have observed that the uh, people at uh, the organization are trying to shift their uh, strategy from perfection to pragmatic approach. And how MVP can help them to become a successful organization. OK. Ali Bakr, you can type your question in chat. You can type your question in chat. And uh, I'll, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Sergi can read the chat as well. So if you're not able to speak, just write your question in the chat box. Yeah, I'll take maybe one or two more questions and I'll st get started with those and then we can add more questions. Okay, so any other question? Any other question from any student? Okay, I'll, I'll start with those two. So sure. let me, and they're both sort of related. So let me go to the first one. And um, how to say uh, your name, Faizan, right? Yeah, Fezan. Okay, so terrific yes. question. Organization success and stratum of work. So, and uh, are you able to see my screen well, or do I need to do any adjustments? Uh, you will need to do an adjustment. I can just see your forehead. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Uh, give me one second. I'm going to do slightly different. Um, one second. I'm going to share just a whiteboard. And... Now, can you see the window? Uh, the yes, I yeah. can see. We all yes, 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 we can see that. Yes. yes. Okay, one second. I'll adjust my screen so that I can draw. So you should be able to see the whiteboard as I draw on it. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. All yes, right. So we are able to see. Okay, super. So let me go um, and tell you who. Um, now, obviously, in this, uh, and I appreciate that you're recording that in this short. Uh, 45 minutes, it's not possible to cover a fairly sophisticated organizational theory that was in development for, I think, over 50 years. But let me tell you how I've run into Elliot Jux and who was Elliot Jux and uh, the relationship to, relationships to organizations and uh, then the success of organizations and companies in relation to strata. So, uh, so Elliot, so... So the way a couple of thinkers in in uh, sort of in the past century, if you look at the 20th century, there were only a few thinkers uh, whom you can seriously study and apply to uh, whose work you can apply to organizations. And sort of a fact is, if you have worked in orga in organizations for over sort of beginning, if, if you have uh, maybe over five or ten years or beyond, you will. Um, see a paradigm that anything that you study in your MBA or in any other uh, degree does not really apply and organizations are sort of running ad hoc without any scientific base to them whatsoever. Is it about the right observation? Um, so now then, uh, c can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so Elliot Jacks went in and studied, so what he and whether you agree with his, uh, 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 so he started very large organization. What you find is, is that an organization is always organized uh, hierarchical, and no matter how, uh, so uh, usually in a uh, sort of in, uh, uh, there is a person called the CEO, or it can be yeah. called as a president or a VP or a managing director, and then the high or the president, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, and so the hierarchy goes in into many, many, many different levels. And if you go at the look at the world's largest organizations, and actually sort of a joke, I say that uh, if you were to take a look at how many levels each organization has, uh, nobody has any idea how many levels it has. If I you work for IBM, how many levels are there in IBM? Um, and while I'm discussing it, sort of, I uh, guess from the uh, first uh, frontline worker to the president of the CEO. Yeah, so uh, pretty much yes. Uh, there's a hierarchy, of course. Uh, there's the uh, there's the CEO, and then uh, there are uh, vice presidents, and then the business unit heads, uh, unit heads, and then a line supervisor. So yeah. How many? How many about would you count in IBM? Oh, uh, never done that. Uh, I would say at least six or seven levels. Uh, go Absolutely. ahead and actually count, count, because what you will find in most organizations, uh, they exceed seven or eight or six or more. Okay. Yeah. Just just uh, hypothetically, if you look at the organizational chart, just count one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can see. This is, I think, I don't know if you can. Can you guys see me? Yes. Here is my camera off? Oh, no, we can see you. Oh, you can see me. Okay. So yeah. anyway, so if you look at the government of Pakistan, if you can, uh, nobody knows. If you look at any major uh, government of a country, you have no idea how many levels there even are. And so now then, and but fundamentally, the fact is that uh, however you rotate and whichever textbook you read, depending on the decade and they all say, uh, what you find is the majority of all organizations, they're hierarchical. Exactly. Um, now, there are some exceptions and there are some um minor deviations uh, for example families are not main but even you know, within a tribe as uh, there is a certain hierarchy but it's slightly different but the modern organization of business is fundamentally hierarchical and um Elliot jack started his work uh, so actually 
met and worked with the LA Jazz. That's sort of how I got into that. Uh, he got into that in, he started working uh, somewhere around after World War II. And uh, I don't know if you how well we're familiar with World War II, but it was a humongous crisis that sort of bestowed on the entire planet. Uh, instead of the current coronavirus, where we're dialing, uh, die, people are dying from a silent disease. And by the way, is it, is, uh, has coronavirus reached Pakistan? Yes, yes. Unfortunately. Um, anyway, so right after World War II, uh, young yellow jugs. Uh, joined and sort of he was a young PhD and MD, uh, joined the company and so he, his work culminated in around uh, 2000. And so what you look at World War II, the world was in a fundamental uh, crisis. And that crisis was out of the explosion of authoritate, um, authoritarian regimes, ending with the World War II. And so what they really wanted to do is they wanted to create a more democratic space or more uh, more democratic space, or at least area called an organization. And so it around, I would say, uh, 1950s, he was in the UK, and he went in and started those large uh, organizations as uh, one of the founding members of the British Psychoanalytic Societies. And so uh, at, at this time, and currently, if you read a lot of MBA books, group dynamics, people, what uh, fundamentally, when you study those types of fields, uh, what they do, and that was sort of prevalent in the 1950s, they're studying what is called group dynamics. Um, uh, and what he found is that groups really don't apply to hierarchical organizations, whether there is a clear set of manager-subordinate relationships. And so uh, if you read uh, current modern books today, you still read about group dynamics, conflict management, improvement, and all of that. Um, sort of stuff that as soon as you finish your MBA program, uh, you relatively shortly uh, forget. And so uh, what he found is that there is a distinct hierarchy. And so the question that uh, uh, he and uh, at the time it was the uh, Lord Brown, who was a managing director um, uh, in, in an organization in uh, United Kingdom, he found that um, there is some kind of a hierarchy over here. And so he had no idea how to study that hierarchy and find out that um, what's happening in this. And so he spent about 50 years, I think about 1950, at about uh, 50 years, and discovered uh, certain founding principles how all organizations run. And uh, with that, he created sort of um, some of um, principles. And uh, however, whether you look at it, whether you don't like it, uh, irrespective of uh, personal people's emotions, that's how all organizations run, irrespective sort of uh, laws of organizations, uh, irrespective if this organization is in Russia, in the United States, uh, whether it's a multinational, uh, as long as it's on planet Earth. And so now uh, what he discovered is that uh, the one of the sort of hunches was that organizations consist what, uh, of an entity called a role. Uh, so, and I, I sort of aggregated that science uh, in, uh, into uh, sort of, uh, I call them three facts. Um, Dr. Jacques presented them slightly differently, but uh, I found that there are three uh, ir irrefuted, irrefutable facts about organizations. And the first facts, and there are three facts that uh, if you can refute, um, I'll give you sort of an A in your MBA course if I could, Dr. Hunt. But uh, the first thing is that in organizations, people are employed in called what it's called as a role. Uh, for example, such as a VP, a CEO, a manager, an analyst, or anything else. Is that about right? Yeah. Okay. A second role is, and that's where we're heading is, that what you found is that those roles differ in complexity. Exactly. Levels are different. Uh, so, uh, sorry for my mis... My, uh, but th those roles differ in complexity. And so fundamental um, uh, sort of ways, uh, at least uh, that, that, that he went in, that how do you figure out the complexity of work in a role? Uh, so, and, 
it's a fairly in not sort of how to evaluate but uh, the major is the question is how to measure so what you um so what you found is those roles they differ in complexity um and so uh the difference so now the question that he sort of went into that in a I call it a scientific, he, he liked to call it a scientific world. So the question was, how do we measure complexity of a role? How to measure complexity. And what I'll do, Dr. Uh, Professor Ahad, I will then save it as a PDF and email it to you as well. Sure. So you, sure. So, so you will have it. But, I will yeah, upload but, it on a student's uh, uh, portal so they can access it and they can use it for their exams and, you know, they can use it for their own learning. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, um, sounds good. So, but sort of, I'm sort of narrating it through a sort of logical fashion how I understand it. And so I'm finding that if I do it through a PowerPoint, it sort of loses meaningless. I'm sending, uh, so... But uh, fundamentally, over the 50, uh, 50 years, so the question is how to measure. And Elliot Jacks was a scientist, so he wanted to measure it scientifically and exactly. Uh, how to measure complexity of the role over years, and it took literally years. What you've discovered that what is a role, and uh, nobody can sort of figure it out exactly what it is, but what happens in this role is there's something happens in that role. And so a role has tasks. Um, So if you look at each role, uh, when you work, um, well, actually some roles in organizations don't have any tasks and we can sort of uh, uh, make fun of them. Uh, I don't know if it's in Pakistan, but if you look at the large bureaucracy, there are a lot of roles <laughs> who have no tasks and it's a joy to be in. But uh, when, you, when you look at the role and then all, um, and so if you look at the role in this way, uh, there are certain tasks that you have. Uh, some tasks are longer, some tasks are shorter, and so on. But role is a collection of tasks. Is that about right? Yes. Okay, so for example, one of the roles on the professor's role is to teach a class. So you have a task over the course of the semester to teach students with all uh, varying active activities. Now, in most organizations, uh, there's sort of uh, my take is that um, I, I make a statement on that, that all tasks... Uh, come from a manager. So the way it happens is that at least in hierarchical organizations, there is an entity called a manager, and here is the role of a subordinate. And so all tasks come from the entity called manager. And so then the subordinate is working on all of those tasks. And a lot of people, um, so I've worked with lots of organizations. I sort of have done about uh, probably over a thousand of role explorations. Many people claim that tasks don't come from the manager, but uh, that's not the case. All of the roles within a hierarchical organization uh, have to be pre-approved uh, from above. So, for example, a CEO gives a scope of tasks um, or objectives. And then, for example, if it's a VP or usually a EVP, then uh, with that EVP within uh, that particular tasking is working within uh, the particular organization. Is it about right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so I've heard of different tasks. The people who work in organizations say, well, I, I, can't, I make up my own tasks. But even if, for example, uh, I have... So even, for example, if you work with an organization, somebody in this role says, well, no, I may, uh, make my own tasks, I always tell them, go ahead and buy a building. Um, in order to get a building, you always have to get an approval from somebody on above. I mean, you can uh, make changes within the scope of already approved tasks. For example, the university professor, uh, Professor Ahad, you have a discretion how to conduct your class, whether to invite a guest speaker or not. It's already been pre-approved. But for example, for you to... Uh, purchase a building or to purchase an online system, you would have to have a pre-approval from the above um, hierarchical organization. And this sort of works within all organizations. So now, now I'm going to get to the uh, head of that. Now then, so um, well, figuring this out, now the final, what he found it, and that's sort of the key to the, to the entire theory of Elliot Jacques, 
and that all tasks have deadlines. Definitely, all tasks have deadlines. There's not a free task without a deadline. Is it uh, most? A lot of people don't actually get this until you've been. But uh, so um, even when a manager assigns a particular task to the subordinate, um, uh, I'll put it here. So where is it? So for example, a manager and Faisan they assign you a task, a subordinate. And subordinate may have other subordinates. Okay, the, in in the, in the manager's head, uh, and whenever you assign task, you already know when this task about should be completed. Correct. Uh, uh, how how yeah. many of you are managers? So I am manager in my company. Okay, so Ali. Most of us you, are managers. Okay, so when you assign a task, Ali, to your subordinates, do you have a sort of uh, an idea of when a particular task should be completed reasonably. Yeah, we always have. Okay, even if you, uh, what I'm finding it in organizations, many managers don't necessarily communicate. Uh, so you might not tell your subordinates when you expect it. So you tell them, get this done, um, prepare, for example, a report. Okay, and a subordinate sort of knows when this report should be prepared so for example the subordinate thinks it should be about three to four weeks and the manager manager thinks about maybe within four weeks time frame but all of us both the manager and the subordinate even though some um, most managers i'm finding don't communicate when a particular task should be completed you always have that unconscious idea when the task is uh, sort of must be completed okay the sort of truisms about organizations is that about right is it is it uh, fair to say that it's a it's a presumption that uh, a manager thinks he presumes or she presumes that this uh, task can be done in a particular time and that is why he or she would not communicate the same because he or she would think that this subordinate is working under me he knows me and he knows how it all works so he would have a fair idea of how long it takes to complete a task so there yeah. is no need to uh, share the deadline. I'm not sure why I'm finding this phenomenon. Most managers, when I discuss with them, uh, nobody clearly communicates, but everybody clearly has an expectation when the particular task should be completed. So they, they, they just, I, I, I can... Sorry. Carry on, carry on. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, it, it, it depends upon the situation to situation, and it varies according to the situation. For example, if I have been a manager, and I have done that task before, I have experience of 10 years and I know that I have done these tasks before in my experience and I know it will take two weeks and I know the capabilities of my subordinate Thank and you. I'll, I'll make, make a gap out of it that if I can done that in two weeks, I can give him a week more, three weeks or four weeks according to the capability or the, the smartness of the subordinate. Yes, that's exactly right. I haven't gotten to that point that um, you're absolutely correct. So the second point is that as a manager, if you work with someone for three months or longer, typically you begin to sort of know the capabilities of all of your subordinates. And you know that a particular task can go to this subordinate, but not this subordinate. And how long for this? So that's another aspect. And I haven't plugged in the capability into answering the first question. I think, uh, and the question was, uh, the, how the organization's success depends on the stratum of work. And I'm going to get to the capabilities in, in sort of uh, in, in a little bit, but you're absolutely correct. Okay. okay. And so we all have this idea. So now then, so all of the tasks in organizations have deadlines. So what LHS has done is, and the problem that why organizations are so poorly studied and understood, and is that when we work with this particular organization, we have no idea exactly what it is, especially now when you work with a, a large organization. So even if you, I don't know if you've ever talked to people, Anybody has ever talked to people? It's a pain to talk to people. Even if your organization is very small, after you talk to them for a day, you, uh, you, you go with this head like this. Uh, but if you have an organization, and that's why most consultants sort of give up, and it's, uh, it's very tedious. So if you go into an organization that employs 100,000 plus people, just the issue of volume, um, uh, how are you going to study 100,000 plus people? So what they do is they'll talk to the CEO, a couple of VPs and then write a report based on who knows what and I'm not 
true exactly what, but uh, let's say if you talk to one person and you spend even 10 minutes with each person, uh, multiply it with 10,000 hours, it's going to be three years to start the one organization. And by the time three years have passed, the organization will have already changed. So there's a certain volume of how do you start a very large organization. So therefore, by definition, they cannot be started by any and have never been started by any modern um, sort of organizational consultant, no matter what your textbook uh, tells you to believe. So anyway, so what Elliot Jacks sort of minor caveats in complexity of organizational science. So don't trust organizational scientists on uh, the, uh, the issue. So what Elliot Jacks has done, so thank you for getting the joke. Um, so he decided, so he said, okay, well, if uh, the way you can actually measure complexity of work in a role in a multitasking role, and uh, I'll make this caveat, and since most of the ta uh, tasks right now are multitasking roles, if you can find the longest task, uh, the longest task uh, defined, so for example, the longest task is one month, so the complexity of that role is one month. The longest in a multitasking roles uh, that would define the complexity of work in a role. Uh, complexity of work. So if somebody else uh, with a similar title role uh, has, for example, a task of uh, two months. So let's say somebody has a two month task, then it means that the role is twice as complex as the first one, slightly. And I'm going to sort of start play play with those. Now uh, it takes. Um, let me actually, Ellie, can I do a demonstration? And so he called Ellie Jacks, I'll do a demonstration how that works and how the question I'm um, sort of getting into, how do you study very large organizations employing 100 and plus so people in a uh, sort of in a very short amount of time to figure out whether they're going to succeed or whether they're going to uh, fail. So what Ellie Jacks developed an instrument called uh, time span. It's called Uh, time span of the role. And what it does, it measures uh, complexity of work in a role. In any role. Uh, let me sort of demonstrate exactly how long it would work. Uh, let me, uh, can anybody time me? Uh, I'm, uh, Any backup? Yeah, like a stopwatch. Alibaka, can you do that? Yeah, yes. Just let me. I'll time myself. Ali, let, let me. Uh, and Ali, I can see you. So uh, give me a first name of any of your subordinates. You can make up a name as long as the person is real. Tahir. I'm sorry? Tahir. Fahil. Okay. So, uh, so Ali. And uh, your subordinate is Fahil, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'll show you how the time span works. Uh, for heal. So I'm for heal. Ali, you're my boss. What am I working on right now? You you, you are working on a uh, on a report, uh, making the missing report of all the clients that we have missed in all in this month. Uh, boss, how long would you give me to complete this task? I will give you around fifteen to twenty days. Twenty days. Okay. Uh, boss, are there any other tasks? Um, yeah, I, I need are... to do few few multitasking as well with, with this task. Me, heal. If uh, do I have anything longer than twenty days, boss? Uh, no, not more than twenty days. So right now it's twenty days. Yes. Thank you, sir. Time. So how long did it take me to do? Um, so I timed myself. I can show you. How long did it take it's me 20, to? Twenty-three seconds. 23 seconds. I actually have it on uh, one minute exactly, one minute and two seconds. So, so you noted all, the whole conversation? Yeah, I recorded the whole conversation and I want to sort okay. of specify it. So within that question, now it took me about, it took me about one minute. 60 seconds. Yeah, 60 seconds. Uh, 60 seconds. Uh, to find out, to get to this number. Now, if I go with that, with all of the pleasant list and be respectful in explanations usually i found that, that i can do it in about in a professional setting in maybe three to five minutes at the most so but within under less than one minute i find out what the company now look at this also 
I never ask you whether you like your boss, what you think about your organization. I didn't ask a single question of anything what's happening in an organization. Is it true? I simply yeah. ask, uh, what's the longest task? So now then, with this type of methodology, with this time span, uh, what we've done, and Eli Jax has done it uh, himself. I actually, uh, working with organizations, I've done um, uh, independent study in all kinds of organizations, small, big. And so what we found is that's how we've discovered the stratum and complexity of work in the roles that will apply then to IBM and organization success. And so what we found is, uh, is this. And so discovery of levels. Uh, of organizational levels and Elio Jacks likes to call them strata. Uh, in, uh, I'll, I'll draw it, but it's a sort of recursive relationship. So I would go into uh, one level of the organization, and I would ask, in, uh, you can repeat it yourself. So I would go into here uh, to the subordinate X and ask, what's your longest task? And he'll say one day. And then I also, from HR, I get uh, who works for whom. And so this person would be working for this person, and uh, it would be a supervisor. Uh, of a kind, and the longest task would be about two weeks. And I would go into the next level of an organization, and uh, somebody over here would say about um, two months, uh, team lead or team supervisor. And then this person would be reporting or um, um, to, for example, a manager. And the manager would have about uh, four months, and so it would sort of go in. And so we, we, we would get that in about uh, less than a day. And then an interesting paradox, and that's where the conflict occurred. That's how the levels were discovered. And the question that Elliot Jacks asked as well as, um, and I actually re I redone, I've redone this whole research. Um, I tend to, in my professional setting, not to believe anybody, and I go in and I recheck it. And so you go into this person and you ask the person X, well, who is your boss? So, and I have the HR chat with me, and that is HR. It's not as classified. It's not secret. They have the same. It says, well, my boss technically is this one, but that's like a that's just a straw boss. If I need a decision to be made, my real boss is this one. So I have a boss and a straw boss, sort of a fake boss. Anybody has ever had this relation when you have a real boss, like the supervisor above you is sort of a fake boss, but the real boss is one or two levels above. I guess majority of the people does. Okay. If you work in organizations for a while, uh, take a look if your boss is a real boss or if it's a straw boss. So you go into this person and says, well, who is your boss? And the question that they ask, well, my boss or my real boss? Yeah, I have the team lead here, but that's more like a colleague. And so what they will say is that this person is a colleague. And this person is a colleague. But the real boss for this person is this boss. And if you go to this person, he will say, the team lead, who is your boss? Well, this one is my real boss. And so what they will say is what we've discovered. We've discovered that there is a level, a distinct level. And so the fundamental principle is that anybody whose longest task is less than three months will say that the boss is somebody whose real task is longer than uh, three months. So it will say anybody who works in this particular area will say that the boss is somebody whose role is just slightly above three months. And it's, it's a universal finding. It works in uh, any country and can test it in Pakistan. With that. I, I don't, I'm not sure if we worked in Pakistan. I think we, we may have gone to India, Eastern Europe, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Africa, uh, Latin America. I'm just not aware of any, but uh, test it out and let me know if it works. It will work exactly in the same way. So what was discovered is that organizations have levels and levels drastically differ in complexities. And there is a fundamental shift between one level to the next. And so working with very large organizations using these recursive principles, we've discovered that all organizations, um, uh, if you look at the world's largest organization, such as Google, IBM is no longer, I don't think, it, I'm going to challenge IBM, and I think it has gone uh, rapidly down. And uh, Faizan, you can uh, tell me exactly where it is. We've discovered that all organizations have at least uh, eight distinct levels of work. Uh, level nine is not present in the organization, and it also correlates to capability. So let me draw those uh, levels and then explain them. Um, 
Uh, so levels levels of work in organizations. And obviously, if the moment a uh, small organization, it would gravitate towards the lower levels. It's a very large organization, a usually a uh, system of government. If you take a look at the government of major countries, I'm fairly sure, including Pakistan, it would go more towards the uh, higher levels. So the levels are as follows. Uh, level nine, uh, you would not find it in organizations at all. So this is the level of uh, sort of what Elliot Jacks called a genius, or somebody who is uh, outside of the organization. And that's usually the leader of a, a, a level of somebody, of a person of a capability well, well, well above of a formal organization. So it's somebody with, um, sort of cannot even sustain within the current organization. Uh, sort of an, an example would be uh, E equals uh, MC Square, Einstein, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, you, you, you can name, you can even think of uh, various thinkers who are sort of uh, major philosophers, um, book authors who cannot fundamentally sustain in the large organizations. But if you go into the world's largest organizations, uh, what you find is you find the following eight levels of work. The higher the level of work, obviously the more successful and more impactful that particular organization is and the less levels of work that's when the organizational crisis uh, IQ if you look at today's crisis at coronavirus crisis and at others you will find the correlation between the levels of work that I'm going to depict on the system and uh, uh, whether uh, in the sort of uh, the success of the organization so the levels of work so Ilya Jacks found uh, level A to be the highest level of the organization. I'm going to draw them and then explain them. Uh, level 7, and I'll explain them how sort of uh, I understand them. Uh, there are no such things as level 6 organizations, and that's sort of uh, it's a nuance of a theory, but I don't want to go into the particular nuance uh, today. Uh, and then there is a level 5 organization. Um, uh, let me do slightly more. Uh, then there is a level four. Uh, level three, this is the levels of work that we're most familiar with. Um, level two, level one, and there is also uh, sort of, I sort of use it a level zero, but most normal people never work at that particular uh, level. And so the way uh, and I'll correlate both the complexity of work in a role with uh, also the uh, person's capability or ability, capability to handle complexity. Because no, uh, not everybody can handle complexity at a particular level. So uh, within the level one role, the longest tasks, um, and I'm going to classify it first by tasks. Uh, between uh, one day to three months. Uh, and... Um, Ali, I think you just gave us an example of a three-month task. The second level of a manager, uh, sort of a managerial level of work, the longest task are between uh, three months to a year. I think most of us are familiar with those tasks, a yearly budget. Then they're really, so this is sort of the, I call them the not that interesting levels of work. The more interesting level of work, and that's where the actual uh, organizational success has come up, and strategic management and the, uh, the, uh, the strategy begins. It's level three and above. Uh, for so level three level of work begins a test of uh, one to two years and fundamentally what it is it's a plan is a uh, boss is able to create a plan that is for example in the next 18 months we will achieve a particular objective um, are you guys okay. with me uh, let, let yes, me tell yes, you how, yeah, with you uh, let me tell you how it propagates through the organization, giving you an 18 months example, and then uh, you can sort of uh, re relate it from uh, level eight. So if the boss has a plan of 18 months, then running multiple managers, he or she can then give assignments of, for example, nine to 10 months. Okay, but that comes out from somebody planning a longer task objective, putting it together. The manager then, if they have a nine or 10 months task, then they can split the task between different roles of less objectives for about two to three months objectives. And so that's how the tasks sort of propagate. Um, uh, they, they become composite of a one um, 
bigger and a larger task. Uh, the level of the, usually this is the level of a director. Uh, the level of the vice president, it's about uh, maybe, uh, a task of about uh, where we're going to be in the next uh, three to four years. And I call it an operational level of work uh, or in a, uh, let me tell you sort of the yearly, uh, well, I can, I can show you later the yearly budget. So this uh, yearly budget, if you take a look at those types of companies, now this is going to be um, one million dollars uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, Ten million. This is about a hundred million. So that you would know the orga uh, organization of which size. This is even about uh, one hundred thousand. Uh, so, so that's a sort of an annual budget. So that you can. LHX didn't like those comparisons, but if you look at an organization of, uh, that handles about uh, 50 or 60 million dollars and you will look at it probably most likely it's a level four organization let me go into the next levels of work so the next one that's where the uh, corporate structures begin so corporations exist at those uh, several levels so let me mark you the levels of corporations so if you look at the corporation so this is a corporation this is a corporation uh, this is a corporation at level five and then corporations also exist at these levels now uh, level uh, seven and level eight. Uh, so this is the only types of uh, corporate structures that can exist. Then go into the level five. Uh, the tasks are about ten years. Uh, usually, there's a president of a standalone company or a president of a business unit, and so would have multiple vice presidents. The longest tasks are about seven to eight years. And if you work in an executive sphere, it's a plan, a strategy where you want to be seven or eight years from today. And for the world's largest organization, seven or eight years, it's a very minuscule level of planning. For example, if you're an aerospace company to develop, uh, to develop a new airplane, seven and eight years is a very minimal and short time. For most of us, if we walk at the front line, seven and eight years looks or sounds like an infinity. An organization that approaches this size are handling at about $1 billion. Um, of annual revenue. Level six, by definition, does not exist. It's not in the theory, but sort of my own uh, sort of discovery. And uh, but the tasks at these levels are delegated from a very larger company. So and they're coming from the company of a level seven CEO. So this level is about uh, okay. uh, ten billion dollars. So the company at level five is grows to level seven and sort of stays at level five. And this level is about uh, $100 uh, billion, uh, level eight and above. And so at this level, uh, the CEO would delegate, that's a nuance of a theory, it really doesn't uh, matter for this uh, purpose of talk. So for example, an EVP, an EVP would run, run multiples, uh, multiples of different uh, business units. And so the level of taskings would be so he'll run one company, I'm sorry, one company and then another business unit. And um, the level of taskings uh, here would be about um, uh, longer than uh, 12 to 18 years, where they're going to be in 12 to 18 years. For example, a mining company discovering a mine uh, for uh, diamond mines, for example. You can do it in two years, but where it's going to uh, self-pay. The uh, organizations at this level uh, looking at about uh, 50 years ahead, and I call this role sort of uh, two generations, uh, one to two generations ahead. And um, I call it a one to two generations is because you're no longer developing so that you can take a look at, at products for today. You're looking at what's going to be the next generations, uh, generation of products or services or the generation afterwards. So for example, if you're head of Apple, uh, you're not looking uh, how to upgrade your phone to from Apple, from um, what's it uh, iphone 10 to 11 but you're looking at what's going to be beyond uh, apple what's going to be beyond iphone or what's going to be fundamental a new different product we're going to launch into the market um uh, and then the very so uh, modern super corporation it's a, corp a company that consists of um, and they're looking at about uh, three to four generations ahead of planning so and that would be the ceo running multiples of different companies so what they do is they have a company and then they have a company and they have a company 
And so they try to run them in sync. So it's going to be a chemical division, oil and gas division, and so on. So what they're trying to do, where we're going to be generations from today. Usually if it's a major government, government of China, United uh, uh, United States, uh, possibly Russia, possibly, if uh, they, they sort of should, uh, they're operating, for example, a simple example is if you're a government in Pakistan, uh, a simple question you can ask. Um, uh, what type of a system of education should we have for children who are just being born today? Is it going to be the same or do we need to change it for the future? And so you're all sort of working with life strategic uh, uh, um, issues that uh, are sort of thinking regarding the future and you're building active plans and you're working on those particular plans. And now for this companies, level eight companies, there are only a few and above. Now the question about um, what you've asked is, let me copy this slide. The fundamental problem with this, uh, and if you look at IBM, uh, let me go into this sort of examples. If you look at IBM, IBM, I, w I would argue, used to be, used to run at, um, it was the number one, as I uh, remember it, uh, IBM used to be the number one company a while back, it was only IBM. Uh, what is it, about 60s and 70s? If a company operates at level 8, everybody uses its products and services everywhere. So that's another one. So it's, if the company is becoming very small, nobody knows about that particular company. So what happens uh, with this role? Now, there is such a thing that's called a capability that was discovered also. Let me insert a new plan and so what you know, what you find is and I sort of slightly deviate from Elliot Jack so when you look at a human being uh, each human being uh, has sort of uh, I call it some um, multi uh, dimensional uh, capability so the difference uh, Elliot Jack said everybody is just capable uh, and that's where I sort of slightly, uh, and I think he would agree with me, but he was just one man trying to sort of develop a whole science. So what he earlier just has said, so at the top of your capability, you have that, for example, uh, stratum of a capability. What I look at that, if you look at each human being, you have a multitude of different capabilities. And some of them are very low, some of them can extend to very high. A simple example I have, for example, um, uh, how many of you are interested in martial arts? Uh, I am for the last four or five years, but I haven't started yet. <laughs> uh, so, for example, um, if you're interested in martial arts, you might potentially develop your capability to a great extent, especially if you have great interest. But if you have no interest in martial arts, putting you in a cage fighting, uh, you will not be upset if you're not going to become the world's famous fighter. Or, for example, if you know a lot of, uh, I know women, uh, if you're interested in fashion, I mean, I have zero interest in fashion. I don't really care where this. Uh, but maybe, for example, Ali, you are interested in fashion. So you can develop this to a level eight, but I particularly care less whether it's stratum one, I prefer the stratum zero, and so on. So now your capability is directly related uh, to your interest. interest. It's your interest, and interest. you can develop those. And if you have, ch how many of you have children? I have a I have children. Yeah, and I so, guess all of them except few. Okay, so if you look at your kids, your your kids also have certain interests, and if they have a particular interest, you can, like for example, if a kid uh, grows up playing soccer, well, they just all they want to do is play soccer. But if the kid doesn't want to play in a particular sport, so some people get upset that they are not level eight capability in everything, but it's not possible, and none none of us wants to develop a level eight capability. To this degree so incongruency with the corporate environment happens is and i'll sort of demonstrate it now in this slide is through the complexity of the role so there is such a thing as a role and each role uh, has a certain stratum and uh, and there isn't in uh in the, so the capability may be within the role or above the role or beyond the role and so what you find in most organizations if you go into the high levels of organizations, you will find the picture like this, whether the role is, for example, in a, a stratum huh, five, six, uh, seven, or eight, and when in fact the capability is in uh, stratum two, three, or four. And this oh. is a great mismatch. If you go into the high levels of organizations, a common paradigm. Um, 
And so what happens is then a person, but um, there is no way anybody can function beyond his or her capability. And so the role fundamentally goes down and it, be it becomes that level stratum two, three, and four role, thus compressing the organization no longer to function at the level uh, which it should function. If you go then to the opposite, if you go into the lower levels of organization, most people are greatly more capable than their roles would allow. And so you will find that the capability is much higher. But this capability still stays there because the whole organization presses your capability into there. So you feel like you're in jail because you're bored. And so people become, uh, they become bored, they do something else, they try to look for another job and so on. But it's a sort of common imprisonment of about I would say about 90% of the population I feel in this way um, sorry to cut you can yes. I ask a question that's that's where my my question lies in uh, I I for for example I think in, is that I, I am lied up in two three or fourth stage but my capabilities are of much higher but I'm stuck because of my bosses or because of the politics around and uh, because of the other issues and i know within five years down the road i cannot go upwards so what what should i do because I, I and also i'm stuck into that industry i have given my 10 12 years in that industry and i can see that industry is also going down it's it's a, if you ever find a solution please email me and let me know the solution. It's a 90% of the world population are stuck in that particular dilemma. And that's why you go to school. That's why you do something else and you try to get out. Some lucky people can start a company. I don't have a solution to this particular problem. Uh, I but, think I guess I have, uh, but I guess I have found a solution. Uh, I can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think uh, I need to continue my job or whatever I'm doing. And besides that, I need to find a space out of it after my job or before my job and start something uh, small and you know start something a uh, business of my own and things like that and give that business a time of three four years five years down the road and do the job as well and then you can decide what what you can do in the future many people do that then please email me and let me know if you're successful and I, I think it's a great way a lot of people for example I'm aware of uh, when they go to the job, they just play on the stock market. They run another business from their current job, and they do all kinds of different activities just to avoid that. It's a huge, it's it's a great societal problem, and um, that is. There. Let me go. Let me tell you a little bit more, and then I'll sort of wrap it up with organizational success. The problem fundamentally within organizations slightly, uh, it, it, it's more vicious than you think. The, the actually, let me go into this slide. The the is um, the, let me just clone it one more time. So there are two issues. Uh, the issue is with the problem with capability. That it's not just, for example, that you can continue an organization if you have a higher capability. Let me draw it on the screen. So, for example, if your boss is, uh, let's say, if you work for the level six person, and the capability is uh, of, let's say, the EVP. Well, let me let me just go. I'll go to the lower levels. Let's say if there is a vice president. Okay, here is the role. And the capability is at level two. And if you work for this, if you're a director, and your capability is at level five, and there is a mismatch in capability, what in invariably happens between both of you, whether you like it or not. And by the way, since it's going to be a public talk, feel free to contradict. There is a great amount of conflict in between both of you that is completely unresolvable. It's irresponsible. It and the, the issue is, is uh, the, your boss thinks that you are disrespectful to him or her, and uh, you, uh, you, you, you treat your boss with contempt, and you treat that naturally with contempt because anything that he or she says sounds literally stupid and basic because you'd like to do advanced things. It's inevitable no matter how you suppress your capabilities. So, what you find is very impossible to suppress. And what happens to those people whose capability is greater than the boss, then they get let, they let go. They get fired, they get laid off, and so on. Now, they, that's a minor sort of personal toll. With organizational success, then what happens? Uh, and uh, Faizan, you asked uh, this question. So what happened to IBM? And I'm going to challenge IBM because it's a public talk, and I've met a lot of uh, former IBM employees 
of the right many rounds of players all over the world. So IBM at once functioned at a level eight company. Now, uh, when the CEO was replaced with somebody who, uh, whose capability was lower, um, and so when the new incoming CEO get, gets into the lower capability, they're all suddenly compresses into the level six. And what you find is that organization no longer works on strategic uh, uh, operations, that everybody is beginning to be compressed into this smaller organization. And so organization slowly begins decay, and then it gets into the crisis and becomes smaller, smaller, and smaller. And so to answer your role, uh, organizational success and stratum of work, they're directly related. So for organization to be successful, it has to operate at the highest possible level of work possible uh, for any country to be successful. And it's first, let me, let, let me sort of give you a summary. Um, if you get into the crisis, uh, sort of the crisis mode in which we are today, uh, and for example, um, if we get in, so not only you have to actually get into the, what is it, uh, level eight uh, or level seven, uh, this is sort of the two uh, two levels which can sort of alleviate the crisis. But if you get into the crisis capability, you have to bring somebody into the level of work whose capability is much greater than the role to solve that crisis, and where, for example, we are today. And so, um, Sort of my take from that uh, from that theory uh, is uh, those those are absolutely crucial and related. And so, if there are most organizations uh, leaders sort of functioning at lower capabilities, and that's why we're sort of getting into this uh, one crisis to the next crisis and to the next crisis. So I think I answered sort of in this talk both strategies regarding the change of strategy and organizational success and what the strategy actually is. So questions, uh, have, have I, did I answer sort of uh, very briefly in an hour? Um. can you? Uh... Yeah, so uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Ivanov. Uh, uh, yes, you've answered the question. So essentially summing it up, I think it's uh, the more we, what, what you are saying, what I understand is that uh, the complexity of an organization is, uh, uh, is and the higher the, uh, is, is a factor of the levels of strata of that organization which is also a contributor to the organization's success. Is that the correct understanding? Correct. It's a direct function. If the organization okay. cannot work at the correct level of work, it's doomed. And uh, what it says, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail sooner or later. Yeah, the people who are slightly smarter, like Ali mentioned, they'll start their own businesses. They will leave. Organization will not be able to develop new products, organization will not prepare for the current crisis, and then who is going to work in your organization? And so it's uh, actually, it goes beyond the organization. It's a national crisis. And the national question is how to bring the proper capability into the proper uh, organizational levels instead of driving all of the capability out of the organizations, which is a paradigm of today's society. Right. Thank you so much. All right. Any, yeah, absolutely. any other uh, questions before we wrap it up and call it a... Uh, yeah. Yes, sir, sir. I have a few, few questions. Yes, sir. So sorry, I, I will take out your time, uh, uh, Sergey Ganov. Thank. I, I, I would like to say th thanks from the behalf of all the class. You, you have given so much time to us. Uh, so I, I just wanted to ask few things that uh, I, I'm because I am talking uh, on behalf of the student level that we are into. We are into our professional uh, uh, jobs, and we we are we have we have an experience of around eight to ten years or more or or less. Uh, but we are stuck in a part uh, where, where you can see that Corona pandemic is also with the with the way of us, and uh, we need to we, we are about to complete our MBA, and uh, we have uh, option of studying more. Uh, and if I would like to study, look, I there, there are few questions about it. And if I would like to study more after my MBA, what what should I study according to the situation and according to the demands of the society? Because as you've been living outside of Pakistan, uh, your, your, your comments uh, do matter a lot. And uh, if I am planning of uh, starting a business, uh, or, or this is the right time or not, or I, why, either should I, either sh I, I should start it or not, and well, what, should, what things should I focus in next two, three years, five years down the road, and what are the opportunities that we have? Uh, I guess I'm asking a lot of questions, but these are the questions that are that are revolving in my mind uh, as as this situation is created and all of the, all of the people are 
you know negative we need to think positive and we need to find out the opportunities in this uh disaster uh i i've learned it from uh, my uh, sort of my colleagues and some of the mentors uh they never give advice and it's very difficult to give advice because you're in a different situation and you uh so but you know it in your heart uh where to proceed and what to do and how to do it um and so I, I would say you should do the right thing. I mean, nobody knows the future and sort of assume that you have to ask those so-called experts and then they give you advice. But I found that sort of in my short career that, uh, that the best advice I can give you is discard the advice that you're receiving and do your own thing. So every single advice I've ever received uh, has always been wrong. And so don't follow my advice, do your own thing. And I think you'll be great to successful. Thank you a lot, and please do share your email address so that we can uh, connect I'll with each share other. It with everyone. I'll share it with everyone. Any any more questions? Ahmed, Anam, Atif, Khalid, Mahar, Marilyn, any question? Well, I appreciate your time. I've I've enjoyed it. Thank you. If you have yeah, questions, email me. Um, Hopefully, I'll have another book out in a, in, a, in a year or two. But I really enjoyed this talk, and good luck to all of you. And the only advice I would give you to the nation, if you want for your nation to succeed, I think it's a function of working at the highest capability possible to build towards the future, and I think you'll be vastly successful. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Dr. Sergi, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. And, uh, uh, Same here. Uh, I think uh, we have learned a lot and uh, I'll share the video link with you so you can uh, have a record of this uh, whole uh, class and uh, we'll keep in touch inshallah. Thank Sounds you, great. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank a you. pleasure thank meeting you, you all. Take care thank of yourself. You. Keep in touch and stay safe. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.